great pleasure to introduce Associate Professor Jennifer Broom. Um, Jennifer is an infectious diseases physician working at the Sunshine Coast University Hospital in Queensland and has a research program that examines the organisational and interprofessional dynamics that influence antimicrobial use and decision making. Um, and she has an infamous brother who's involved with great cartoons around AMS, which um, I love to use as part of um, presentations to get um, people talking. So thank you so much, Jennifer. We look forward to your talk this evening. Um, thank you, Michael, for talking. And I actually think it's better to have a surgeon talking prior because I, I realised when I was asked to present this that we don't actually, as ID physicians, treat uncomplicated or mild intra-abdominal infections. We, get, we manage the complex collections that have got multi-resistant bacteria. So in fact, um, and oftentimes we were talking, um, Michael and I, about this topic that actually the surgeons are often braver about stopping antibiotics than we are often. We're often keeping them on for a week and then by the time I go back to review them, the surgeons have sent them home. So um, look, I think we can learn a lot from our surgical colleagues as well. Um, and so yeah, I really appreciated Michael talking. Um, so I was asked to speak to on antimicrobial stewardship and um, I guess, as you probably, a lot of you know, it's my area of interest. Um, so just in terms of conflict of interest, I don't have any conflicts. Um, I have had some funding through the um, Advanced Queensland um, Fellowships, um, the Australian Research Council and some local um, funding. So uh, what am I going to talk about today? I'm going to talk about um, the drivers of antimicrobial use. Um, so I guess um, in all our antibiotic decision making, we've got to figure out where our, where our choices are coming from. Um, also um, collaborative approaches. I think um, I'm very um, strongly advocate, um, advocative, I don't think that's a word, of um, collaborative approaches with um, different specialty teams within our hospital. Um, and so I'm going to give some examples of how we've worked with the surgical team at our hospital um, in intra-abdominal infections and also surgical antibiotic prophylaxis. Just in, as an example, now it's not directly relevant to HIF, but it's an example, I think, of how we have to move forward thinking about HIF um, and thinking about working with surgeons um, in terms of HIF and intra-abdominal infections. And also um, about how all these principles and issues apply in my mind to intra-abdominal infections. Now, obviously we have patients in front of us, this cartoon um, kind of looks at the short-term versus long-term co long costs of antimicrobials. Um, now, um, you know, short term, we'd like to kill every bug that's causing infection in the person's tummy and get them well. And um, but obviously, always we're balancing the risks to their flora, um, the risks to um, you know the future of antimicrobial use. In terms of AMS, um, these are just kind of my general um, principles of AMS, which is um, that I've learned over many years of trying and failing at times to improve things and examining different people's perspectives um, with a lot of um, in-depth um, research. I guess as a general principle, when we criticise people or other people's practice, they get defensive and angry and stop listening to us. And I think that our best skills are to work with other specialties or our best um, hope is to understand other people's perspectives and why they're doing what they're doing. Um, I don't think we can change um, antibiotic use in other specialties. I think we need leaders. We need the Michael Donovans and the different people within their um, specialty services to change practice within their service. Um, we're regulatory, our regulatory approaches aren't working as well as we wished for. Um, we're in a really fast paced world. Um, HEF is um, one example of this, I think, you know, there's a lot of pressure and particularly down south, I guess, at the moment, you know, with all the COVID pressures, I'm sure that you're trying to get people out as fast as you can. Um, and there's been quite a lot of um, literature actually about trying to get um, early discharge for intra-abdominal infections because of COVID overseas. Um, so we're in a, um, we're in a fast paced world that needs change quickly. And often um, the choices like antimicrobial choice and kind of conservative antimicrobial use is down in terms of the priority um, compared to the other things that we're trying to achieve. 
Um, practice is not, often not consistent with guidelines and it's often driven by fear, but also different belief systems. And um, that's why it's really great to talk to other specialties about what they believe and what the basis of decision making is. I think for people to listen to us, we need to earn their respect, both by showing up, asking questions, listening to their point of view, but also looking at the literature ourselves. So I think knowledge, compassion and availability is probably key to um, antimicrobial stewardship. Um, and healthcare professionals are almost always trying to do the best for their patient. So where we go in there, um, you know, critical and wanting to change practice in a kind of judgmental way, it doesn't really work because they're actually trying to do the best thing in the individual circumstance. And often the short term win, if we can, you know, persuade someone to change their antibiotic is not worth it if we alienate someone um, and we alienate our relationships in the longer term. So the things I've considered um, over many years are why, why does antibiotic overuse occur? And I think it's um, quite complicated um, with multi-level influences. And those significant influences I'm going to talk about a bit, but they're both multi-level, so um, from government down, really. You know, government pressures on what our hospitals provide, um, executive pressures, um, professional and interprofessional pressures. And how can we incorporate these understandings into um, sensible, um, and effective antimicrobial stewardship. And I think that stewardship is not just, you know, I come and talk to you about the antibiotic you prescribed, it's actually individuals, teams and systems. And I really struggle to define what is an effective intervention and how we measure success. And also when we can accept that failure and limitations within a complex system is okay, because I think a lot of times our systems aren't set up for appropriate antimicrobial use and in many circumstances where we may not be effective. So um, I'm not going to go through all the you know, 12 years of research, but I think, you know, this slide kind of summarizes what I've come to believe is that we all have common emotions. So we all um, are afraid of clinical failure, we're afraid of disapproval, we're afraid of the hierarchy of people telling us we did the wrong thing, we don't want a sense of futility, and we want to look after our patients. And then we're different because, you know, and this would apply to HIF, HIF is different to, has different um, pressures to inpatient use, um, we're different in um, Queensland than we are in New South Wales right now, and we're different in Mount Isa than we are in Brisbane, and so all of our um, you know, our pressures are different in different sites. We have different levels of support, different resources, and we have different patients because our patients have different needs in different settings. So we have done a bit of research on uh, surgery specific issues. Um, now, uh, surgeons own a lot of risk. I know I would feel very intimidated by going and, and cutting a patient open. Um, and I think you, you own the risk of a, a negative outcome. And I think that has to be respected when we're trying to work with surgeons um, in terms of antimicrobial use. Um, there's dynamics between surgeons and anaesthetists. Um, they don't actually have a lot of interaction with the um, antimicrobial stewardship team commonly because actually they're in theatre and the antimicrobial stewardship team isn't. Um, there's hierarchies between and within teams. Antibiotics are not the highest priority. If you've got a complex trauma coming into theatre, Antibiotics aren't the highest agenda item in theatre. Um, not everyone believes the clinical guidelines. Um, there's litigation risk. There's also wanting to do the best for their patient. And then there's the, well, you know, we're in a difficult situation. Why don't we just try something approach, which we do in, um, as physicians as well, not just um, as surgeons. So, um, I mean, Michael's talked a lot about um, the specific types of um, intra-abdominal infections. I guess what I would say is that you know, we're always balancing risks. We're bar balancing morbidity versus not getting the pus out and long periods of antibiotics and potential failure. We've got lots of bugs, so it's really hard to give directed therapy. It's polymicrobial. So we can't really just narrow our spectrum particularly easy, easily. Um, we have empirical therapy often. We, we don't always know the bacteria. Um, and we have collections that don't really resolve without a blood supply. So as Michael was saying, if they're big enough, they're not going to go away um, without drainage because the antibiotics actually don't get in there. And then, of course, you've got escalating bacterial resistance. And so the empirical cho choices get broader as the um, bacterial resistance increases. And I was kind of horrified to see a... Um, 
uh, conservative management of appendicitis that said that carbapenems were the best effective therapy and you know they possibly are effective but I was just really worried about what that meant for the longer term that wasn't actually in Australia but um you know and and in that paper there was no discussion about the collateral damage um that we'd use by treating um uh appendicitis appendixes with um carbapenems I think HEF is complex, and I have to say I'm not a HEF doctor, so um, all of the HEF doctors who are watching, you know, feel free to contradict what I'm saying at any time. I, I think as an ID physician, um, I, I worry about um, do I know when I'm failing? So am I um, reviewing them enough? I'm comfortable reviewing patients in hospital. You have to get confidence that patients are going to come back in or the HEF team is going to send them back in if it's failing. I don't think IV antibiotics are necessary often. Oftentimes, um, people get sent home on um, IV antibiotics. So, for example, cellulitis and other things that actually they could have oral antibiotics. Um, obviously, we don't have all antibiotic options at home, so some of them aren't stable. And so sometimes we'll get pressured into something that's a bit broader spectrum because it's once a day and it's stable and it's, you know, so the choices, um, the dynamics of decision making are different. So sometimes you've got to balance spectrum versus discharge. And maybe that's the right thing to do because maybe they get more bugs through staying in hospital, but it's still a complex thing to decide. Um, I still, I do think the issue of not being under the nose of the surgeon is hard. And I think um, interspecial collab, interspecialty collaboration is hard in hospital. And when you discharge on HEF, that's even harder. Um, and then there's the short-term versus long-term gains. So the beds versus source control versus AMR, political pressures. Now, I'm not necessarily anti-HEF, but I think there are, and this, probably, this slide probably says that I am, but um, I was just focusing on the, the complexity of decision-making issues. Now, there are a lot of benefits for the patient getting them home, making beds available, um, all of that kind of thing. But there are also um, complex dynamics and antibiotic decision making. And then um, my, Michael briefly talked about, you know, do we need antibiotics at all? Um, so there are actually, I mean, more broadly in infectious diseases, I think we're looking at shorter durations and we're looking at um, do we need antibiotics in particular situations? So there's a number of um, studies that are coming out um, looking at um, whether you need um, extended antibiotic use. So this is actually one just saying um, that you could give um, short course, so less than 24 hours of IV antibiotics and then oral antibiotics rather than extended IV antibiotics on hospital and the home. And this is for um, acute appendicitis. And I think this is um, after um, an appendix operation. So basically going very quickly to oral antibiotics rather than giving ongoing IV antibiotics and whether you even need them at all is the other question. Um, and this was, um, you know, this the stop it trial. So um, looking at short course for people who have had source control. So um, actually people who have had a collection in their abdomen, that was for a number of different diagnoses. Um, and they actually looked at um, fixed durations of um, around four days. Um, versus um, after clinical resolution. And what they found is that, you know, if you um, had longer antibiotics, what you did is you delayed the diagnosis of the recurrent infection. You didn't prevent the recurrent infection, but you actually de delayed the diagnosis of requiring a reoperation. So actually we try very hard with our surgeons to look at shorter course um, post-operative antibiotics um, after, after source control. Um, and then there's um, a trial that looked at observational versus um, antibiotic treatment for uncomplicated diverticulitis and actually showed that there were no significant differences um, and didn't prolong recovery and could be considered for un uncomplicated disease. So actually, um, maybe, maybe the um, study that was presented first could have had a third arm, which was, um, you know, no antibiotics at all potentially, or maybe that wouldn't have been acceptable, but um, it would be an interesting question to ask. Um, but changing processes and optimizing processes is really complicated. Um, and I think um, the current model for stewardship um, in Australia is very much kind of surveillance and identifying individual um, behavior and limiting access to antimicrobial drugs and approval systems and things. 
Um, but it kind of overlooks the fact that we're actually players in a complex system. Um, and actually a lot of things are influenced by things beyond our control. And there are a lot of dynamics that we actually, um, that we can't influence ourselves. So um, just another, I mean, all of these are meant to be fairly satirical, but um, I guess, you know, working with people um, to understand what's going on um, seems to work better than, um, than kind of regulation and punitive approaches. And I, I hope that we're moving towards that kind of approach. We certainly are in our hospital. So we did work with the surgeons. This was a few years ago, um, actually with a surgical basic trainee um, who came wanting a project. And um, when I first, uh, when he first came and talked to me, he said, I want, I want to do a checklist. Um, for um, abdominal infections um, so that we uh, shorten the duration. And I said, well, I, I don't, don't know checklists work, but why don't we actually use the hierarchy and why don't we, um, you know, use your social dynamics within your surgical unit and why don't we try and um, reduce an intra-abdominal infection duration um, uh, using those influences. So we had, it's a really poorly designed study because it's a pre and post study and anyone that's done um, any kind of research will know that um, pre and post studies are fundamentally flawed in terms of their statistical power, but it's um, a story anyway. Um, and it's based on uh, a paper we wrote quite a long time ago um, showing what the influences are on IV to oral switch. So actually, this is more generally, not just with intra-abdominal infections, that we actually have a lot of um, factors that influence our decision to switch to orals or to stop. And um, part of it is fear of clinical failure and, and, and complications. Part of it's communication. So senior doctors not telling the junior doctors to stop or not, um, not being on the wood round every day, hierarchical factors. And then we seem to have this mystical power of IV antibiotics that we believe they're more effective, even, then, even though they're not, um, always. Um, and so we actually, um, in this study, uh, had the doctors and nurses from surgery, um, NID and antimicrobial stewardship, and we discussed the stop at trial and looked at influences on antibiotic duration. And there was a, a, a significant consultant led presence um, in this study with a focus on hierarchy, surgical team decision making, um, evidence for antibiotic duration and early cessation. Um, we also had some posters. Um, and what happened is um, essentially the total duration of antibiotics um, significantly reduced. The IV duration went from 5.4 to 4.5 days, but the IV and orals, and that was just not quite significant. Um, and then the IV and orals went from 9.2 to 6.6 .6 days. Um, and actually there were, um, there were um, less complicated patients um, uh, in the first group, I think there was uh, more appendixes. So there were actually more complicated patients in the second group. There were more kind of uncomplicated appendix in the first group. So um, we did some qualitative data collection. I always like to know why things work. Um, and also so I don't re replicate um, things that are not helpful in the future. So what was perceived to work by the surgical teams was consultant engagement multidisciplinary and multi-team level discussions and ownership from the surgical service. But the AMS team input wasn't perceived as particularly helpful. The posters no one saw and um, nursing and pharmacy engagement wasn't perceived as particularly significant. This is just a quote from that study. So one participant said, um, so from my point of view, if something goes wrong with the patient, the consultant is the one that's going to get blamed. You can chuck all the blame on me, but everything's going to be resting on the consultant because they're the one whose name is on that patient. And so thus any clinical decision they want done for this patient, and they specifically want this done, knowing all the information that ID would suggest otherwise, I do what they want because they're the ones who bear the brunt of it if something happens. And also they're your boss. So they're the ones who can yell at you the most. So um, after that, um, I decided um, on the basis of a lot of um, uh, the data that we were having that I was going to have to do a, a more robustly designed study. So um, this is not actually intra-abdominal infections, but um, it's actually on surgical antibiotic prophylaxis. But again, um, working with our general surgical team, of which um, Michael Donovan is part of, 
Um, so it was basically using empirical data on influences on prescribing um, and looking at um, whether we could use an intervention um, of social influence in addition to auditing to actually see if we could change people's compliance with antibiotic prophylaxis. Um, so it was multi-centre um, and 24-month interrupted time series and some qualitative assessment of what happened. And basically we, we focused on um, barriers, so addressing barriers to um, evidence-based practice, so guideline mistrust, um, lack of visibility of the guidelines and prioritization in the operating theater. We looked at enablers, so targeting social dynamics within the surgical teams, hierarchy, role delineation, making consensus decision making um, within units and um, also ownership. So I would only work with units where um, the directors and the senior doctors would agree that they needed to lead the study because I don't think anything's really that effective if I lead change in other units. Um, so we actually studied uh, 1,757 patients undergoing surgical procedures at three health services um, and, and six bi-monthly time points and qualitative interviews were performed at the three sites. Um, and we, so we embedded quality improvement and um, but also social influences. So they actually did the data collection themselves. So the registrars and junior doctors within the surgical teams did the data collection. And the, the results, I think, were interesting. So um, if you look at um, site one, which is actually SCU, you'll see that um, actually they had um, started to improve um, before we started the intervention. So if you look at the slope over time, there was a gradual improvement in um, prescribing quality um, before the intervention. Um, it increased after the intervention, but actually not st statistically, statistically significantly differently. Um, at another site, um, essentially there was um, very limited engagement. There was a little bit initially, and then they basically um, had great difficulty data collection, lack of ownership from the study, and essentially no improvement. At site three, which I think is really interesting, um, they initially did a wee bit and then they failed to get engagement after um, registrars changed and it was all really difficult. And right here where that carrot is, I actually offered to withdraw them from the study. I said, look, it's not really working. And I understand that you've got conflicting priorities and it's not a problem. I, I just think we probably need to stop. And they really, really didn't want to stop. So they decided at that point that um, it was going to be mortifying if they pulled out of it and a senior registrar in their unit decided that they were going to get all the junior doctors to change their ways and do data collection and do antibiotic prophylaxis correctly. And then we got a dramatic improvement after that. So the combined effect of that um, was essentially a no change study. So, but I think um, what it does show is that and what's interesting is that if you analyze the pre and post data, it would look just as a, a whole group, it would look statistically significant, but actually it shows that you really do need interrupted time series to look at these things properly over time. But what I was really encouraged about, despite this, was actually the trajectory towards improvement at SCU and how actually, um, you know, I think working with teams over time can, can actually improve things. Um, so of the qualitative analysis, the site um, that reported senior surgeon engagement um, showed steady and consistent improvement in prescribing over the whole 24 months. Um, contextual factors um, at the other sites like um, lack of engagement, lack of knowing who was running the study um, and competing priorities in terms of development at different sites, you know, the undergoing change processes, so change fatigue lack of um, FTEs, all those things actually limited people's ability to engage, which and it's not that they didn't want to. I think it's actually that they couldn't within that, within that environment. Um, and so what I really felt is that senior ownership was a predictor of success, but that actually um, the key role of senior leaders in change indicates the critical need for us to engage other specialties in the stewardship agenda, but that actually where we're failing in any area, we need to look at the contextual factors, you know, are people under stress? Um, is there a lot of other change processes that's going on? Are there other priorities? What are the executive, what pressures are they putting on? Because actually people aren't, um, 
you know, robots and they operate within a complex environment. And if people can't engage in change, there are often external reasons for that. <clears throat> so for me, antimicrobial stewardship is advocating for AMS as a priority from the executive downwards. And I think that, you know, as much as, you know, we're approaching accreditation at SKU in October, I think, you know, um, we need change that's meaningful, not um, a tick box process for accreditation. Um, we need to realize the limits of what we can do in the current system and also accept where people have reached their limit and what they can do. Um, admit that we can't do AMS alone, that it re requires organizational and other specialties to change. And I think embedding care about antibiotics and change and, and other specialties needs to happen from the top down. I think as an AMS physician, um, you need to be available, interested, supportive and collaborative. Doesn't really work if you're critical. Um, and we need to build skills and organizational change and health services research within organizations. In terms of HIF, I would say we need to challenge whether antibiotics are needed at all. Um, the most convenient dosing, dosing regimen is not always the best option. I feel like we need frequent review of decision making and that requires close collaboration between OPAT teams, ID teams and surgeons for intra-abdominal infections. And source control and early cessation of antibiotics is often possible. Um, and recogn recognizing the influence of politics and the pressures of discharge and looking at short versus long-term gains in terms of beds versus AMR, I think we need to be mindful of. Um, and I'm very grateful for all of the collaborators um, that I've worked with over the years, particularly um, Alex's team who's already been mentioned in the Sydney Centre for Healthy Societies, um, who have um, basically done all of this, uh, all of the interviews and a large amount of the um, qualitative work over um, the last 10 years or so, and who have really driven um, this research program. So very grateful to them.